Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I'm Clark Irvin, and I am delighted to welcome you to the first virtual session of our Sunday morning speaker series. And I'm especially pleased to introduce you to the very first speaker in our series, Professor David Blight, who is the author of the magisterial Pulitzer Prize winning 2018 biography of Frederick Douglass titled Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom. Dr. Blight is the Sterling Professor of History, African American Studies and American Studies at Yale University. And he's also the director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale. A member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Professor Blight is the author of a number of other important books and articles, including Race and Reunion, The Civil War and American Memory, which won eight prestigious prizes, including the Bancroft Prize, the Abraham Lincoln Prize, and the Frederick Douglass Prize. And he's also the author of an annotated edition of Douglass's second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom. With that, please join me in welcoming Professor David Blight. Professor, thank you for being here. Oh, and thank you, Clark. And uh, thank you, Reverend Haig, and to all the staff uh, at St. John's Church. Uh, it's, uh, to say the least, a great honor uh, to, to address this congregation, its members, and anyone beyond of such a historic church. Um, I wanna start just with a quick reference to, of course, John Lewis, who just passed in the past two days. Um, everyone has their John Lewis story. I was privileged three times to join him on his famous uh, civil rights pilgrimage, twice in Alabama and once in Charleston. Uh, the one in Charleston was held the year after uh, the massacre in Charleston of June 2015. Um, John Lewis to me always sort of felt like a, a prophet. Uh, you know, he was a, a small, short, uh, sweet, but not always sweet, Isaiah, uh, walking around in the blue suit of a congressman. Uh, he spoke with a prophetic voice, a prophetic vision. He could be so kind, so loving, and so sweet. But when his passion kicked in, you heard the other side of Isaiah. Uh, you heard the, the burning in, in the voice of, a, of one of the Hebrew prophets. Uh, I think that's what we just lost. They don't come along very often. Uh, that, I hope, transitions at least to, to some extent to this... Um, I think also prophetic figure of the 19th century, Frederick Douglass. Now, people in Washington, D.C., uh, hopefully by this time, need very little introduction to Douglass, uh, at least the, some of the contours of his life. Um, but I want to start with two biblical passages. I, I don't just do this because I'm speaking to such a historic church, but I do this in most of my book talks because I do think it's a place to start with Douglas's uh, worldview, his mode of storytelling. Two passages, one from Genesis and one from Jeremiah. The passage from Genesis is in chapter 8, um, verse 11. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So Noah knew that the waters were abated off the earth. Well, that's the Noah's Ark story, of course, and a particular moment in it that Douglas was fond of using. And I will come back to that uh, as I end this talk and a particular place that Douglas found to use it. The other is a passage from Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah chapter one, where Jeremiah says, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. To destroy and overthrow, but to build and to plant. Frederick Douglass, by um, 
by learning, by reading, by experience, by life, was an American Jeremiah. He spoke with a voice that could sometimes find the language, like the Hebrew prophets, could, could often find the language to capture what was happening to Americans, what was happening to the nation, what was happening to his people, what was happening to slaves. That is one great definition of a prophet. Those people who have that special ability to hear language in their head and convert it into stories that tell us, to some extent at least, what's happening to us. That was Douglas's secret, but a very public secret. Now, there are many things we can say about Douglas and his legacies and his meanings, and I just want to go through a few of them that are favorites of mine because they get us thinking about where we are today. Douglas was the prose poet of American democracy in the 19th century. If you want to find somebody, at least in the 19th century, who was explaining what democracy could be, who was explaining the meaning of slavery, both in its mental and its physical aspects, who had so much to say about the nature of racism, who had so much to say about the meaning of that colossal civil war in the middle of the 19th century, which destroyed the first American Republic and gave birth to the second, there is no better voice than this Douglas, uh, who wrote millions of words in um, short form editorials, political editorials in his newspaper of 16 years, who wrote 1,200 pages of autobiography in three autobiographies, and the third one was even revised a fourth time. And then in thousands of speeches, uh, for which he may be more famous than anything else. He was a man of words, but also with a kind of unsurpassed eloquence, he explained, he explained what slavery meant in American history. He expressed with, a, at times, a kind of terrible honesty and a savage irony, both the power of America's principles, its creeds, and the hypocrisy with which his country contradicted them, denied them, did not live up to them. That's at the core of his most famous speech, the 4th of July speech of 1852. It became a kind of an American phenomenon, uh, an American wonder almost, to see or hear Douglas in the 19th century. Um, people would talk about it that way. I have many instances of newspaper clippings or personal accounts of people who would reflect on the first time they saw Douglas or the one time they heard Douglas, what he sounded like, what he looked like. Um, he, he, he lived with, especially after the Civil War, uh, a, a very personal and sometimes terrible problem of fame. We today would call this celebrity. They didn't really have that word then. But fame had its perils as well as its pleasures, and he lived with it. He was a uh, women's rights man, speaking of legacies, uh, in a time when there weren't very many women's rights men. He was the only black abolitionist at the Seneca Falls uh, Women's Suffrage Convention of 1848. He signed its document. Uh, he, he even supported women's economic rights in the state of New York in the 1850s. He will have a terrible falling out over the 15th Amendment, famously with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan Anthony, and a few others. We could come back to that in Q&A if people wish. He could be both, and th this is what's so richly fascinating about Douglas, there are contradictions in his thought, and are there not in most great leaders, most great thinkers? If they don't contradict themselves at some point, uh, they probably wouldn't remain interesting. Uh, he could be a radical thinker at times about social change, about strategies, about methods, including the possibilities of violence, but he was also a kind of classic political liberal in the 19th century. And what that meant in the 19th century is a belief in law, 
at least a preference for law, for change that would come through law, through politics and through the vote. So he could teeter between these, these, uh, these spectrums of radicalism on the one hand and a belief in, in change through law on the other. He lived both of those. At times, he both loved and hated his country. And we have to be honest about that. There were times when Douglas gave up on, all but gave up on the United States, especially in the 1850s. Uh, on the eve of the Civil War. There were times in the late 1840s uh, when, when, when he was a very angry young black man who had returned from a flowering experience in the British Isles of 19 months. He came back to America in 1847 preaching lines like, my country hates me and I hate it back. I have no country, I have no patriotism. Then other times you can find a Douglas who is a, a almost supreme patriot, especially in the wake of emancipation, in the wake of the Civil War. Uh, he could be a fierce believer in self-reliance by black people. He famously spoke to this issue over and over and over again, especially with black audiences advocating that they continue to create their own institutions if they could lift themselves up exercise their liberties and rights as when they had them. But he was also uh, a fierce believer in activist interventionist government to free slaves, defeat the Confederacy, and protect black citizens against terror and discrimination. And anyone who tries to put him in a box of self-reliance uh, bootstrap self-reliance, which the American right today has tried to do, uh, is missing more than half the story. And anyone who just wants to put him into a radical box of, of just big government intervention, that's not going to work either. Douglas doesn't fit very many boxes, except for his always and everywhere and eternal belief in the natural rights tradition in the basic creeds of the Declaration of Independence. Douglas, by the way, loved the Declaration of Independence. He loved its principles. It was the practices that he, of course, always had so much trouble with. He forged a, uh, in politics, he forged a hard-earned kind of pragmatism out of experience and out of disappointment and at times sheer despair and out of some victories. If you're looking for a model of someone who was never elected to office but became a very important political figure who has to learn a kind of a hard honed pragmatism about change, he's a model for that too. He was in my view fundamentally not a self-made man despite um, uh, the way people portray him today and the way he portrayed himself. One of his most famous speeches was called Self-Made Men. It's actually a remarkable speech that he gave many, many times. He actually gave it first before the Civil War, but he especially gives it after the Civil War. Uh, it's a remarkable speech. It's, it's not the kind of just bootstraps individualism that one might think. But Douglas was not entirely self-made. He had help. He had people in his life who helped form him, like all people do. Yes, he was 20 years a slave, and yes, he is the product of self-invention and constant re-self-invention in those autobiographies. But especially women helped shape him, sustain him, helped him create a home, especially his first wife, Anna, Anna Murray Douglas of 44 years, uh, his daughter Rosetta, his oldest child, uh, his second wife Helen, uh, and many other people in the abolition movement who helped, helped sustain this man. That takes nothing away from his own uh, bravery, his own uh, ferocious intelligence, his genius, but he wasn't entirely self-made. 
who is. He seized on the King James language of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, and he used it to deliver the most enduring critique of America's central dilemma, slavery, racism, uh, the destruction of slavery, emancipation, reconstruction, and its aftermath that anyone in his century at least ever did. And if you're looking in some ways for a leader, a figure uh, who represents some kind of moral quality to his politics, Douglas is a case. She, yes, he was a pragmatist. Yes, he had to learn some compromises, especially after the Civil War, when he gets engaged in that Republican Party and he gets engaged in politics. But uh, there's a morality at the heart of Douglas's political vision. And sometimes today we are yearning for that, aren't we? Now I wanna, I wanna come back if I can to this, uh, my use of, his use of Genesis, of the Old Testament. And it also segues into his relationship to the Civil War and his relationship even to Abraham Lincoln. Um, go with me if you would to 1864. Uh, those of you who know your Civil War know that this was a year of terrible bloodletting. It was the bloodiest year of the Civil War. In the summer of 64, the war was in near total stalemate in Georgia, in Virginia, and, even, and elsewhere as well. Uh, there was no clear outcome yet. There was still the possibility of a version of Confederate victory if the North would simply give up and stop and it's an election year. And by the middle of summer, uh, Abraham Lincoln and his party were with very good reason worried they would not be reelected. War weariness in the North was profound. The casualty uh, lists out of Virginia in particular were horrific. Uh, field hospitals all over Northern Virginia, all over Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. in eight, the summer of 1864 was one vast hospital of the wounded and the dying. Abraham Lincoln called Douglas to the White House in August of 64 for his advice. They had met the previous year in August of 63. Uh, the first time Douglas went to the White House in 63, he went on his own. He had no invitation. He basically just knocked on the door and he got in and had a relatively short encounter with Lincoln at that time over uh, Douglas's protest against uh, the unequal treatment of black soldiers. But in 64, Lincoln invites Douglas because he needs Douglas's advice. He, he wanted Douglas's imprimatur as the most important black spokesman in the country and as an abolitionist. He also had a scheme going. Lincoln looked Douglas in the eye in his office at the White House and asked him to be the leader or organizer of a scheme to funnel as many uh, slaves out of the uh, upper south states into, from the border states into the north behind union lines to some definition of legal freedom before election day because Lincoln feared he would not be reelected. And that if George McClellan and the Democrats win this presidential election in the midst of civil war, that bets were off. This war could end in chaos. It could end in some variation of Confederate victory. It could end in recognition of the Confederacy. And it especially could end without slavery being damaged enough to be destroyed. Douglas looked Lincoln back in the eye and he said, uh, sure. He had no clue how he was supposed to do this, although he was told in very simple terms that he was to organize this with the War Department and with the Army. Douglas went back to, to Rod, Rochester, New York, where he lived. He, this was late August, 64. He started sending telegrams and letters to his friends in the anti-slavery movement, his friends who had been recruiters of black soldiers. And 
He started to line up people to help him organize this scheme, even though he really had no details to offer them as to how in the world they were supposed to do it. He was saved from having to implement this scheme, which didn't have much traction anyway, by the war, especially by the fall of Atlanta to General Sherman uh, in the first week of September, 1864, by the fall of Mobile Bay on August 25th of 64, Admiral Farragut's taking of Mobile Bay, and then General uh, uh, Sheridan's moves down the Shenandoah Valley. The war on the ground turned, especially Atlanta, which had a huge impact on Northern morale. It now looked like there was a real possibility that this war is gonna be prosecuted to victory probably the end of slavery, and that there was some end in sight. Now, Douglas wanted a campaign for Lincoln at that point. They had started out in very different places at the beginning of the war, very different places, but they had come to basically speak from a similar script about the meaning of the war. But the Republicans would not allow Douglas to go on the campaign trail for Lincoln. The reason was the Republicans under, were under ferocious attack by the Democrats in what was, to that point in time, the most white supremacist, racist campaign ever conducted in American history. I always tell my students that the 64 presidential campaign was the most racist campaign ever until the next one, because 1868 was even worse. The Democrats and Republicans were very different kinds of parties in the 19th century than they have reversed and become now, as many people know. Well, the Democrats were using classic wedge politics. They were painting the Republicans as the party of, of black emancipation. They were, they were N-word lovers. They called Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Africanus the first, implying that he was really black that if you voted for Republicans, there was gonna be intermarriage and on and on. They, they used every racist idea you could trot out in the 19th century and some we haven't even, we haven't even thought about in the 21st century. So they weren't gonna let this, this greatest black spokesman out on the campaign circuit for Lincoln because it just reminded people, oh yeah, Republicans are the party of emancipation. Douglas was angry about it, but he sucked it up like he had many times before. He spoke at a major black convention in Syracuse in October, uh, where he gave a barn burner of a speech saying, no matter what they say about us, no matter what Democrats are doing in this election, our future lies with a Republican victory, because only then will emancipation really come. And on election day, first week of November, 1864, uh, Douglas was in Rochester, of course, he, uh, <laughs> I have an account, it's in my biography, of a man who claimed he had been the poll taker, the poll worker who put Frederick Douglass's ballot in the box that day. People wrote these reminiscences later about Douglass, the way people wrote the same kinds of stories about Lincoln. Anyway, this guy writes up the story. I found it in a Rochester newspaper in about 1881. And he said, he put Douglas's ballot in the box. And then that evening, since they lived near each other, they walked back into town to go to the telegraph office to hear about the election returns. And he says, as they were walking back into the center of town, four white drunken thugs came out of an alleyway and they challenged Douglas to a fight. And according to our witness, Douglas put up his fist and said, come on. Well, I don't know if that's exactly true, but I went with the story because our witness then tells us that the drunken thugs uh, scurried back into the alley and Douglas went on to the telegraph office. But most important, the next Sunday after the election, Douglas went where he had spoken countless times already. He went to the Spring Street African Methodist Episcopal Church in Rochester, the black church. And he took the pulpit. Lincoln had been reelected. 55% of the popular vote, 76% of the soldiers vote at the front. And Douglas got up, packed house. Uh, they couldn't even fit the people inside. 
And he began simply by the story I just cited out of Genesis 8. He knew he didn't have to explain this to his audience. They knew the Noah's Ark story. He began by simply saying, you know, Noah with the ark began to wonder as the ark seemed to take land somewhere. He wondered, is it possible? Is it possible? Is the flood over? So Noah sends a dove out of the ark. And the dove returns with an olive branch in its beak. This is Douglas telling the story in his own words. And so Noah wondered even more, is it possible? And he sends the dove out again. And the dove does not return. And lo, Noah decides to take the tarp off the ark. And the world had been revived. The world was drier and turning green. Douglas starts that speech, in effect, with the oldest rebirth story in, you know, Western literature, in Western civilization. The flood was over. It was possible for the world to renew. When in doubt, Douglas drew his storytelling from the Hebrew prophets, but he didn't stop there that day. He announced in that speech that a week later, on the following Sunday, he was going back to Baltimore, which of course is where Douglas had escaped from slavery in 1838. He hadn't been back to Baltimore since he ran away from there at age 20. He said, I'm going back to Baltimore next week because Baltimore just, or that is Maryland, just held a referendum. The state of Maryland held a referendum at the, right at the beginning of November to decide whether to become a free state. Maryland had always been a slave state. It did not secede from the Union technically. It was a horribly divided place during the war. But Maryland had voted very narrowly, something like uh, 20,900 to 20,300. It was ridiculously close, worth remembering, to become a free state. And Douglas announced, he said, I'm going home. I'm going home to the free soil of Maryland. And he did the following week. And he had paparazzi in tow, which is why we know a good deal about this visit. He had press with him. And Douglas walked back in, the first time he'd been back in Baltimore. He walked into Fells Point. He went up Dallas Street. He went to the Bethel AME Church, another black church, a church he had worshipped at as a slave teenager. And when he approached the front of the church, he was met by a woman. Her name was Eliza Mitchell. She introduced herself and said, hello, Frederick, I'm Eliza, your sister. He hadn't seen her since 1836. Eliza was a bit older than him. She had married a man named Mitchell. She had had eight children, I believe. She had named one of them for her famous brother. He took her by the arm, we're told by the press. They marched up the central aisle of this church, packed house again, people outside who couldn't get in. We're told that the pulpit was surrounded by American flags. And Douglas got up and he started the speech in Baltimore the same way he had back in Rochester with the Noah story. Noah sends the dove out, dove returns. Noah sent the dove out again, no return. Pulls the tarp off and lo, the world is renewed. But then Douglas had the audacity to say, but today that I have returned to Baltimore, a former slave to the free soil, I am the dove, I am the messenger. He says, I am the rainbow on the sky. Now that's Frederick Douglass using the language, the cadences, but the essential stories, the metaphors of the Old Testament to place his audience in a story. And what has he just done? He has said the possibilities now of emancipation are as important as the second beginning in Genesis. 
That was Douglas. That was the nature of his rhetoric, his wisdom, uh, his prophetic voice. Uh, thank you. I welcome now uh, questions from near and far, and I'll turn it back over to Clark uh, and others to run the Q&A, I think. Thank you very much. Professor, thank you. That was just magical. Thank you so much. So uh, let me ask the first question, if I may. You mentioned in passing Lincoln, of course, and as I was reading the book, I couldn't help when reading the passages about the relationship between, I think it's fair to say the complicated relationship between Lincoln and uh, Douglas, to think ahead almost exactly a century later to the complicated relationship between President Kennedy and Martin Luther King. Could you elaborate on what you see as the parallels and if there are any differences as well? Oh, well, thank you uh, for that question. I'd love to. I actually wrote about this earlier in the previous book a little bit. Uh, in the second Kennedy-Nixon debate of 1960, there may be a few people listening who can even remember it. Um, Kennedy made the point that, uh, arguing against Eisenhower, of course, Nixon had been vice president, that uh, Eisenhower had done nothing about civil rights. Uh, what has the president done for civil rights? And then Kennedy used the language. He said that, you know, presidents can do a great deal with a stroke of the pen, quote unquote, meaning executive orders. And Kennedy even implied that, what, that a president could do a lot with that about housing discrimination, even voting rights. He said it, stroke of the pen. Well, Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Council in particular never let Kennedy forget that. And when Kennedy was elected, almost immediately after he was elected, and especially after inaugurated in 61, they started to lobby the White House. They lobbied the White House relentlessly to get Kennedy not only to to uh, issue executive orders. They had an ally. They had more than one ally. They particularly had an ally in the White House, a, a White House lawyer named Harris Wofford, whom some people may remember as a senator. Uh, Wofford had been on the Civil Rights Commission. He, anyway, Wofford was the lobbyist almost sort of inside the White House. And through a series of, of efforts, they even got uh, Martin Luther King, to the White House in 61. Uh, they'd met earlier. They had actually met during the 1860 campaign, and Kennedy had even made the famous phone call to Coretta King while uh, King was in jail in Birmingham, and so on and so forth. Or was it Albany? I forget which. <laughs> anyway, um, King meets Kennedy at the White House. Kennedy gives him a tour. They're in the Lincoln Room. And on the wall, of course, is an original of the Emancipation Proclamation. And King says to Kennedy, at least according to King, that, Mr. President, you should issue the second Emancipation Proclamation. You should issue an executive order outlawing segregation in all aspects of American life, the second Emancipation Proclamation. And, and we're told that Kennedy said to King, well, uh, there's, there's an idea. He says, uh, why don't you draft something? Huh. And did they ever? Uh, the SCLC lawyers, King's lawyers, got to work in 61. They worked to sit, I'm leaving out a lot of incredible, wonderful detail here, but they worked assiduously in 61 and into 62 drafting a document. There's a huge document you can get on this at the Kennedy Library. It's actually online now. It's 60, 70 pages of precedents all about executive orders uh, from the past, uh, you, the FDR's creation of the FEPC, Truman's desegregation of the military, on and on and on, saying, President Kennedy, you can do this. Executive order. Now, we all know that this, by and large, won't happen until after Kennedy is assassinated. It'll happen in the 64 Civil Rights Act under LBJ, and it'll happen in the Voting Rights Act of 65. It's probably better that it came out as congressional legislation. But 
that lobbying story of SCLC and King's movement working on Kennedy, who was reluctant at first because of the strength of the Southern Democrats and the Democratic Party. And, you know, Kennedy was very ambivalent about what to do about civil rights, but it, it took people inside the administration and then this pressure from outside such that right after the Cuban Missile Crisis in late autumn of 62, Kennedy did issue an executive order outlawing discrimination in housing. And that then set up a process moving toward March on Washington that would come the following August of 1863, where as we now know, John Lewis uh, gave a, an important and famous speech. But his speech, as people may know, was at the insistence of the Kennedy White House toned down a bit. Uh, and not quite as radical as it might have been. Because again, the Kennedy White House was trying to, you know, keep this dance on the fence between Southern Democrats that they didn't want to totally lose and the civil rights movement, which was taking over the American conscience. Uh, it's not unlike, I mean, it's very different in some ways because the media is all different, but that relationship between Lincoln and Douglas back during the Civil War does make a fascinating comparison. Actually, somebody should write about that comparison. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You hey, others? others? Uh, I do have some more questions. Um, thank you all very, very much for submitting your uh, questions. Um, unfortunately, we will not be able to get to all of them, but some of the questions, um, let me read some of them. Um, would you elaborate more on your statement about Douglas having a model for change? Is there something that we might learn from him that applies for today? Well, yes, and many things. Uh, they're not always what everybody wants to hear, but that's all right. Uh, Douglas had a long view of history. Actually, if, if you're following uh, the reminiscences of John Lewis, so did John Lewis. John Lewis's appeals to never give up, never give up, never give up, keep believing in the creeds, keep believing in the creeds, that, that comes right out of Douglas, whether John meant it or not. But uh, Douglas, first of all, believed that natural rights were given of God or of nature. Take your choice. They could not be destroyed. Whatever happens, they could not be destroyed by slavery. They could not be destroyed by the terrorist violence of the Ku Klux Klan. They could not be destroyed by lynchings, no matter how horrible those creeds would endure. Now, that's, that's a hard thing to tell people who just lost their son in a lynching. That's impossible to tell people who just had somebody killed trying to vote in 1871. Um, but that's where Douglass's faith began. D Douglass's belief and faith that, that he could sustain in this thing called the American experiment came essentially, as I tried to imply, from two sources, two traditions. One was this secular tradition of the Enlightenment, the natural rights tradition. Uh, the belief in equality, uh, the belief that these are God-given liberties. Uh, he, once, he once likened uh, natural rights to precious ore, that they don't belong to anybody, they belong to everybody. They're in the earth, they're ours. But he also drew upon the biblical tradition of what some people would call the social gospel of the New Testament, but also to Douglas, it was this long, Old Testament view of history that people sometimes are sent into exile. Uh, sometimes they're all but half destroyed. Their temple has to be destroyed. Isn't that the story? Uh, isn't that what Jeremiah was always predicting? Isn't that what happened? And they go, to, they go into exile, and some of them stay in exile. Some of them never return, but some might. Douglas made great use of the Exodus story and all of its various derivations. He never gave up on the promises, the positive elements of the wisdom of Isaiah and the wisdom of Jeremiah, his two favorite prophets. Um, he never stopped using them as a way of attacking back against racism, attacking back against slavery. He never stopped using that line from Isaiah you know, that there is no rest for the wicked, no rest for the evil. 
whether that evil is an individual somewhere or a nation state. Um, as for social movements, Douglas went through every stage that abolitionism had from moral suasionism, you just work on the human heart, to politics. And after the Civil War, in the fight to try to preserve the remaking of the Constitution, uh, to try to preserve the greatest results of the Civil War, which were black freedom and equality, uh, he used every strategy possible. But the thing to remember about Douglas, in his century at least, that he never had elective office. He never tried for elective office. He might have tried in upstate New York at some point, but it, 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 it is pretty clear he always saw his most important weapon as his voice, uh, his pen and his voice. And he had to do this with words. He had to do this with persuasion. And that is often very frustrating. You know, we can all write op-eds. We can all, you know, give a lecture somewhere. Or no, we can't all do that. Some of us are lucky enough to do that. We can try to write books. Uh, we can deliver sermons. Uh, we can teach. But some days you just get frustrated and you say, you teach and you teach and you teach and whatever changes. But that's what Doug, that, those were Douglas's weapons. So for anyone out there who is a minister, a teacher, uh, you know, a, a daycare center operator uh, of any kind, or a politician, you lead by persuasion. It sometimes is all we have. In fact, in the last sentence, of Douglas's long form masterpiece, his second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, published in 1855. When he had to end that book of 440 pages, he wrote a line, and I'm paraphrasing it, but it says, as, uh, as long as heaven allows me to do this work, I will never forget my humble origins, and I will do my work with my voice, my pen, and my vote. He added vote to that idea of voice and pen. And frankly, that's about all any of us have now, is a voice, a pen, and a vote. And we don't all have the pen. Um, you know, maybe some people have great wealth they can use, I guess. But all most of us have is a, is a, a voice or a vote. And not enough of us use the vote. Amen on that. Um, one of the other questions which you just briefly touched on um, was that sort of talking about your wonderful op-ed in the New York Times um, that came out a couple of days ago, uh. um, and you were talking about monuments, and, and for us here in Washington, um, the Emancipation um, yeah. Monument in Lincoln Park is, is something that we've been... Um, dealing with and talking about for a lot. Um, can you amplify sure. on what you thought and what you're thinking now? Yeah, well, I wrote an op-ed about the Freedmen's Memorial too a couple of weeks ago on the Washington Post, which got me into a little trouble on that, but trouble's a good thing. Um, I've, you know, everyone has their opinion on that monument in Lincoln Park because of its visual content. That kneeling slave is offensive to, to most clear thinking people today. And, and, and I said it is. I said it actually is a racist visual image. On the other hand, that is such an important monument, in part because of the people who created it. It was created largely by African Americans. The money was raised by African Americans. The event to unveil it was organized by African Americans. The master of ceremonies was John Mercer Langston, an African American. The, an AME bishop gave the invocation. That Doug, Frederick Douglass gave the speech on dedicating it, which I think is the second greatest speech of his life. It's an absolute masterpiece. Uh, a young black poet read a poem, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Archer Alexander, the model for that uh, kneeling slave, uh, was not only a real person, but a very interesting person from St. Louis. You know, this, this monument has a history worth knowing. And Douglas himself, we now know from the intrepid research of uh, friends of mine, uh, Scott Sandage and John White, 
just recently. In fact, I wrote that op-ed without knowing about these documents. They found from some intrepid online newspaper research that five days after that unveiling in the, new, in the National Republican newspaper in DC, Douglas spoke out and said he wasn't thrilled by that kneeling slave either, but he preferred the addition of some other kind of emancipation memorial that might one day go with it. You know, so there'd be this monument to Lincoln that it is very 19th century, granted, a standing almost godlike Lincoln. No one would do that today, at least artists wouldn't. But he said, let's build a more fulsome, robust, positive emancipation monument next to it. That's, I think, what should ultimately be done. Now, the piece I had in the Times yesterday is just suggesting and it's been misread by some people, but that's okay. That's why there are opinion pieces because there are lots of opinions that react. I was just suggesting that I thought the Biden campaign in its many aspects, uh, since it is creating task forces, excuse me, on many, many things these days about the economy and healthcare and so on, that it ought to create a task force, a serious task force that takes a little time and studies this issue of monuments and memorialization, because the Confederate memorial landscape, it appears, is by and large coming down and going to come down uh, in ways most of us in this business or this field never thought we would see, but we are seeing it. So let's take a look at this. Let's, let's not so that the federal government can tell people what to do, not at all. This is gonna be vernacular, it's gonna be local, let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, this city and that town or that school or that university is going to decide to memorialize this instead of that. But why not have a task force of serious people who actually studied this for much of their lifetimes come together and begin to try to harness all this energy and maybe even some resources, not unlike the model of the 1930s federal writers and arts project that seeded these ideas out in localities and post office murals and monuments and memorials and writers all over the country, not only as a means of employing people, which was one of its aims, but to help Americans figure out their history. Uh, I just thought that was a reasonable idea. We'll see, it may or may not uh, fly. Some people think that's too top down, not enough bottom up, et cetera, et cetera. The New York Times, unfortunately, put a tagline in the piece about heroes, which was exactly the opposite of what I argued. I argued in that piece that we should perhaps stop thinking about heroes and start thinking about historical events and ideas and concepts rather than just who's a hero we can replace these old bad heroes with because I, that is still gonna get us in trouble. Today's heroes might not be the same heroes in 50 years. Now that might, John Lewis may be an exception. <laughs> I hope so. Um, but we ought to harness this incredible energy now about historical memorialization and understand it uh, before we start replacing everything on the landscape or as we are replacing our memorial landscape. Well, as professor, I cannot thank you enough you were absolutely magnificent. And I urge everyone to read the book. And in regarding that, by the way, we're gonna make a recording of this available to everyone. That'll be up shortly. And in addition, we'll be sending information about how, in addition, obviously, to Amazon, uh, the book can be published by local bookstores or bookstores elsewhere in the United States. With that, Professor, thank you ever so much. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, thank you, Clark, and thank you, Reverend Haig, uh, and uh, God bless you all at St. John's Church.